Namaskar. Good morning. Uh, we had a nice uh, discussion yesterday. So today um, you said you, I should talk on. Uh, uh, where is Hans? God. Mm. Messing with the I thought. I thought you got fed up with yesterday. <laughs> so, um, um, you said a subject of my choice, but do you have any subject of your choice? <laughs> huh? It's a risky question yeah. because we have, of course, many, but uh, we li like also you to talk whatever comes from your heart. So, so for a cha for a change. Uh, can we talk about the Sufi system? Yeah, yes. that's a good idea. Mm -hmm. okay. Because uh, there are two uh, reasons why I want to do that. One is because I have personally uh, been grounded quite deeply into the system in some way. Um, and the other is because there are many funny ideas going around about Sufi system. So. It's a good idea to discuss this matter. You don't have to accept what I say, but... First, the word Sufi. Right, that is uh, primary, the word Sufi. Um, the Sufis, the name Sufi was unknown to uh, most people, in, especially in the Western world, till um, some of the English writers uh, of the teachings of the Sufis. I can't exactly remember some of the names, but there were some very good writers uh, about Sufism. And most of them are uh, English, they're from England, because they had a contact with India for a hundred years. So like John Woodroff picked up Tantra, some picked up the Sufi doctrines, and some of them had traveled to Egypt and so on. So, so the first uh, introduction to the Sufi teaching, while they define the word Sufi, they said that it came from, now this is the popular accepted definition, that, not even definition, the nomenclature, the name. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. They said that in the olden days, the mystics who were called the uh, Sufis, used to live in the deserts, uh, in caves and so on. And uh, in winters it became very cold. So, you know, the nights, the temperature drops down below zero in deserts. If you have been to any of the African deserts or to the deserts in Mongolia or somewhere, you know that it drops down to below zero at night and daytime is very hot. So. They used to wear uh, robes made of um, uh, sheep's wool, sheep's sheep, S-H-E-E-P, sheep's wool. And this wool, um, in Arabic language, is called Suf. So those who wore these robes were called Sufis. I mean, this is one of the uh, reasons for the name given by a very prominent English writer on the Sufis. And so the Sufi word stuck. If you ask a Sufi, who are you? He will say that I am a traveler on the path. A Salik, which means a traveler on the path. He won't know what you're talking about unless he's familiar with the Western understanding of the Sufi word. And he may not be wearing wool. Because <laughs> he's not living in the desert, you know, minus temperatures at night. Right? So, uh, a Sufi is a traveler. And no Sufi will call himself a Sufi. He will call himself a traveler on the spiritual path. And it is the Sufis who discuss a lot about stations, which we discussed yesterday. Because for them, you're a traveler, so you pass through different stations in life, inside, and so on. 
So, where could this have developed first? It, uh, it certainly did not come from India. I don't believe everything came from India. No. Yeah, many good things came from India, I agree. But uh, Sufis don't, didn't come from India, <laughs> the origin at least. Although there were very prominent Sufis living in India at one time, because many had to escape the Caliphate because they were being uh, persecuted and prosecuted for being uh, rebels against formal Islam. So many of them came to India and settled down. That's a different story. But the origin goes back into the deserts of Arabia. Hmm. I'm saying this because there's another derivation of the word Sufi. Hmm. When uh, the founder of Islam, Muhammad, used to live in Medina because he was driven out of Mecca, by the rulers. Um, he built a small mosque there which still exists in Medina. Actually, the, it has some other name but the Arabic word Medina means a city. That's what it means, city. So, he prayed in a small mosque and lived in a small house. Um, outside the mosque, on the veranda, there were four or five people sitting. Nobody knows who they are. They are from the neighboring neighborhood, Bedouins, sitting there, who neither prayed, didn't go into the mosque, did not even did listen to what Muhammad was saying. I just said this quietly. So some of the zealous disciples of Muhammad said, why are these people doing it? Throw them out. <laughs> Who are these guys? Yeah, they are not praying, they are not listening to, they are just sitting there. So why are they sitting there? Throw them out. So Muhammad said, well, <laughs> I would call them the people who are sitting on the bench. There was a bench there. So uh, a bench, when you sit in a row, R-O-W, on a bench, in Arabic word is Safa for that. Safa means a row or a bench. So he named them the sitters on the bench. <laughs> huh? He also called them the devotees on the bench. <laughs> oh, so he called them Asahaba Safa, which means devotees on the bench. <laughs> and they didn't pray, they did nothing, they just sat. And one of the earliest derivations of the word Sufi is from the Asahaba Safa, Safa Sufi, one who sat on the bench. Um, uh, two. And the third thing to note is Prophet of Islam Muhammad lived a very simple life before. He used to live quietly in Medina. Now when he lived, he used to he could have asked for a new robe, but he always used to stitch his own robe when it got torn and wear it. So the Sufis also, many of them followed this technique of not buying new clothes, I mean not going to the malls, there were no malls then, um, that stitching their own clothes when they got torn instead of changing them and to new. It's also a Buddhist practice. Huh? Stitching their own patched robes, they are called. And when people asked him, why are you doing this? Because if you ask, they can get any number of robes for you. He said, this poverty is my pride. You know, in Arabic, it sounds very nice. He said, al fakhru fakhiri. Fakhr means pride and fakir, you know, fakir means a poor beggar. I mean, so he said, al fakhru fakhiri. My, this poverty is my pride. Okay, so there also there is an origin, some connection for the Sufi. One is these fellows who sat quietly on the bench doing nothing. You would say doing nothing, somebody would say. Somebody would say doing something without doing anything. Uh, do two ways of looking at it, right? So that's one origin of Sufi. The other is this wearing of the patched robe came from there. And fortunately, 
among all the mm, personal sayings of Prophet Muhammad of Islam, one of the uh, prominent sayings of mm, the, the founder of Islam, Muhammad, was in Arabic, it's Man Arafa Nafsu Fakhad Arafa Rabbu, which means he who knows his self knows his Lord. Mm. Anybody knowing Arabic here in your group? Mm. Unfortunately. Man, <laughs> man ar and Sanskrit? Little. Yes. A little bit, yes. <laughs> man arafa nafsu, he who knows his self. Fakhad arafa rabu, he knows the Rabb, the Lord. Rabbi, Rabb. And also in Hebrew, Rabbi, Rabb, God, Lord. So, um, so this is the basic origin. Afterwards, this group of little people who believed in the inner self became a separate part. And uh, the first Sufi order that came from the deserts of uh, Arabia was called the Rifai order because it was founded by someone called Rifai. Um, they practiced a lot of pranayam. They also practiced a lot of chanting and certain exercises. When the Sufis did their practice in alone, when they breathed in, they chanted the sound of Allah inside. And when they breathed out, they, like in Kriya, one of my earbuds fell off. The Ida, the Pingala is still here. <laughs> I think it has gone to my Shushumna. <laughs> Checking for it in the Muladhara, but no. <laughs> anyway, we can do with one, I can hear you. So, so um, when they did this practice, internally it was Allah, when they took the breath. And when they chanted out, it's a good practice. Try it. See. Who? See that who sound? Sometimes they do suf, which is another reason why they call Sufis. <laughs> the use of the sound suf. You know, when you're very tired and you come and lie down, sit in the armchair. Sometimes you make Suf. It relaxes your system. So one is. So they said, Allah, who? Now the Westerners who went to look at them, they didn't know anything about this. They only heard the sound, who, who, who. So they called them the howling dervishes. Howling. H O W L I N G, like an wolf. Wolf. <laughs> Ooh, ooh, ooh. Like an wolf. How does a wolf on a full moon make? <laughs> so they call them the howling dervishes. These belong to the first order of the Sufis. So because of Suf, because of the people on the bench, because of the chanting of Suf, because of wanting to discover the self so that they can discover the Supreme, and so on, some people stopped normal work and started pursuing this path wholeheartedly. Such people were called the Sufis. Hmm? So the Sufi believes, let's use the word Sufi because it's common. I don't like to use the word, but that's a common word. The Sufis are very practical people. They believe that if you are going into largely unexplored territory, you need a guide. Otherwise, you might fall down in various pits and stumble. So they believe in a teacher to guide. But they also believe that a student who is mature and learnt whatever he has from one teacher may be allowed to go to another teacher to learn. So many Sufis have different teachers. Huh? And 
the teacher is called the sheikh, not the oil company sheikhs. <laughs> the teacher is called the sheikh and is also called a murshid. And the disciple is called a murid. So, this relationship continues. The Sufis do not believe in worshipping any images. But there is a Sufi technique where you are allowed to visualize the teacher. They call it catching the picture. Uh, where, since you can't have any other image, you think of the teacher in the heart. Mm. So, this is, now there are many orders of Sufis. Although it started with the howling dervishes, later on it spread came into contact with Persia. The Persian civilization was very advanced. They had their own mysticism. And some of the Sufis came in touch with Indian uh, yogis. So there was a kind of mix up and therefore different orders were created for the Sufis. Uh, some of the prominent orders are the Nakshabandi orders, the Qadari order, the and so on. I mean, there are many. Mm. And in different parts of the world, there were different orders more prominent. But one of the most prominent of the orders is the Nakshabandi order. The Nakshaband means one, the people of the design. Naksha means a design. People of the design. So they try to figure out what is the design to be created in order to reach that which has no form, no shape, no nothing. When you go there, you destroy the design. But till then you need a design to move. They are the Nakshavandi Sufis. Now, before we go into what are the actual teachings of the Sufis, I mean, now you have a rough idea of what it means. Know yourself to know the Lord and so on. Some laid more stress on emotional, which is like devotional practices, of having devotion to the Lord and so on. Some practiced the techniques of breathing and some were very, very philosophical in their understanding. So it all depends on which order they come from. But one good thing is you can go from this order to that and that order to that, no problem. Right? Depending on where you are moving and how mature you are. I know you want to know some Sufi techniques, we will come to that in the end. So, this is one thing. Now, the Sufis are very practical people and some of their teachings are very interesting because they touch upon different kinds of people who learn. There was this great Sufi teacher who, who started the Nakshabandi order, whose name was uh, Bahauddin Nakshaband. Um, he had a disciple who was hoping to become his successor. You know, it happens in all ashrams, huh? believe me. People are wanting to become successors. So, there was one guy who was very close to... Uh, now, this, the whole of Sufi is the study of the mind. So, this guy was wanting to be... The, so, he, he had the habit of flattering the teacher all the time. Whatever he does, he says, oh, this is wonderful. If he breathes, he says, ha, ah, how well you breathe. And, um, he didn't see him in the party, of course. Yeah. But then, uh, <laughs> um, one day, uh, there was a huge gathering of 2,000, 3,000 people. And the teacher sat, Bahauddin gave a talk, beautiful talk. At the end of it, everybody departed. And this disciple who wanted to become the successor, who was always flattering him, uh, putting butter on him, he said, Oh, Master, this was the most wonderful congregation that I've ever seen. 3,000 people listening spellbound to what you were saying. The Master said, yeah. But there is one problem. He said, What? He said, only one person understood. 
So this guy was very thrilled. He thought, he's saying, you know, that you are the only one who understood. So he said, who? He said, me. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody else understood what I was saying. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> this is the subtlety of the Sufi teaching, what I'm talking about. Hmm? So it's basically a study of the mind. And all the practices that are there are meant to make your mind still calm, subtle, sharp and being able to explore the higher levels of consciousness. For that you need a preparation. All their practices, they say, are preparations only, which may be dropped when you have done with them. Hmm. Now we come to a prominent Sufi who's in There's much I can't say in one hour, but yesterday we mentioned Jalaluddin Rumi, hmm? the, the author of the Maznavi. If you have an English translation of the Maznavi, it's good to read. Hmm? I'm not sure if it's there in Finnish, but at least certainly in English do you get it. Hmm? Um, now, Rumi was the founder of a particular order of Sufis who are called the whirling dervishes. Yeah. Whirling dervishes, they go round with their hand, one hand down and one hand up, uh, in circles. So why are they going around in circles? Because, you know, uh, Rumi was very clear that this is meant only for a certain type of disciple, not for all. He said, this particular practice is meant for a certain kind of disciple, whom he called the phlegmatic type. <laughs> mm. Because it needs to be shaken up. <laughs> mm. And it's interesting to know how Rumi got into this uh, whirling act before, because no other Sufis used to whirl. There were those fellows sitting in the caves and saying, whew, Whew, that's all, but no whirling. Hmm. He had a very close friend who was a goldsmith. Jalaluddin Rumi himself was a great scholar of Islam and all that, and he discarded it when he met his teacher. Hmm. His teacher was Shams at Tabriz. Shams means the sun, and Tabriz is the name of the place where he came from. And Shams was a naked man. Now in Islam, it's prohibited not to wear clothes. In formal Islam. Shams was a naked man. And he was a madman. And Rumi became his disciple. So he forgot all about his studies and his jurisprudence and everything was thrown away. Yeah. And he fell in love with Tabris. So much so, that maximum spiritual development for Rumi happened when Shams disappeared for some years. The pining to see him became his discipline. The truth he was seeking was replaced by Shams himself. He was dying to have a glimpse of the one who had disappeared. And then it occurred to him that the one who has disappeared is always here. It's not anywhere outside. And he changed. Okay. So, um, one of his close friends was a goldsmith. So one day, uh, Jalaluddin was walking on the street when he came in front of the gold shop where the goldsmith was sitting. You know something? These satsangs we are having with you in Finland, they are among the best. Because somehow you guys inspire me to talk. <laughs> mm. I'm not, please, I'm not uh, rubbing butter on you. <laughs> anyway, I don't want to succeed you as a guru. So, <laughs> uh, so he was standing outside the gold shop and he heard his friend hitting with this little hammer on the gold to change his shape. So it went tick. So Rumi turned one side. Then he said tick tick. 
Then he turned around. Then he said, tick, 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 and he went around. And then again one tick he stopped. It occurred to him, this is a good movement <laughs> for spiritual practice. So he went out. Also for the reason, you know the Isha Vasha Upanishad. We have done it sometime before, right? Huh? It says, this whole universe is moving. Yatkincha Jagat Yam Jagat. This entire world is called the world Jagat because it's always Jagat Yam, always moving, nothing stops. And this movement is always circular. You see, seasons go and come back, the world moves in circles, the electron moves in circles. When you see a good looking uh, girl, the man moves in circles. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe. Um, uh, everything moves in circles. <laughs> when people, you say, when you're fully, somebody is very popular, he's the center of attention. Now, what does the center imply? That is a circle. You can't have a center without a circle, or a circle without a center. So, this eternal movement that's happening is like the hurricane, the cyclone. But in the center of this movement, there is a spot of silence, which is called the eye of the cyclone. There is no movement in the eye of the cyclone, but it is that which sucks everything in. So, in this constant movement of life, and everything. There is one spot, center, which is silent. This is the center, which is the essence. So, in the movement of the dervish, of the whirling dervish of the Rumi order, before he starts whirling, it's not just whirling for fun. The music is on, the reed music, blowing of the reed, and he goes round and round and round. In his mind, he thinks this is the movement of life. He's trying to find the center. And while this movement is going on at its height, one hand is raised up to get what comes from above. One hand is down to give what comes in outside. And there are many going round. And at the proper time, when the whirling has to stop and one has to touch the center, the teacher, the sheikh, suddenly says, freeze! Everybody freezes. In that freeze, you touch the center. Yeah. Even that whirling has to be learned carefully. There are different ways to do it. You can't simply whirl, you'll fall down. So, I know when you're a child, you must have sometimes seen, if you find a post or a pillar, you catch and go round and round the pillar. Right? I don't know if you didn't, but I used to do that. Then when you stop, you see the whole world is going round. If you don't hold on, you will fall down. Right? Because there is no... So here the idea was to bring about the perfect imbalance in the midst of all this balance of movement. Look, if you are totally balanced, you cannot find the truth. Somewhere it has to break. <laughs> hmm? The wars that are going on in the world, the fights that are going on, the pandemics which are on, these are all the result of 2000 years of sanity. If only one person became insane, the whole thing would change. <laughs> So, these are some of the uh, teachings of the Sufis. There are many orders. So, Rumi, its order is still existing. It's called the Mevlevi order. Unfortunately, it has now become merely a show. Nobody knows why they are whirling, unfortunately. If you go to Turkey, to Istanbul, the government organizes for the tourists, the whirling dervishes. Does it mean anything? <laughs> You can see the tourism department of Turkey organizes. 
at least just a drama with music people come and they look nice of course it's nice but the real whirling and the silence is inside so oh, this is rumi now there's something i want to tell you just before we if you have any questions yeah i know i'm sure you'll um rumi also said that it's not my personal idiosyncrasies that you have to copy but understand what i'm telling you the truth uh rumi uh, jalaluddin rumi had uh, a personal uh, interest in a turkish bath you know what's a turkish bath hot water inside which you sit it's a turkish bath you have turkish towels turkish bath huh came from istanbul now istan is a corruption of the word sthana s t h a n sthan asana place anyway so rumi used to after doing his the whirling and so on sit inside the hot tub now the mevlevi order has made it compulsory that all sufi should sit in hot tubs why <laughs> <laughs> that was jalaluddin rumi's personal idiosyncrasy it's nothing to do with the teachings so what happens is even among the sufis even among the vedantis even among the nath pandits people pick up unessential parts and begin practicing it and forget the essentials i like her to wear a red shirt maybe because of my marxist background but <laughs> from kerala i don't know. <laughs> so i like to no <laughs> no this red also is the symbol of shakti the devi red see this i'm painting a red bindu out there uh uh-huh. just started working on it so red is also the color of the bindi you see women in india it's red mm-hmm. even men so now tomorrow if somebody says i am a really sincere follower and disciple of my because i always wear red shirts does it mean anything no <laughs> yeah so most of the discussions what we can do in a short while i have discussed about the sufis in the end i need, need to say that in some sufi orders there is more emotional content some sufi orders it is more practical but the ideal thing would be to bring them together in a certain ratio so that one doesn't get too emotionally and also not totally ignorant of the mechanism of the practices um yesterday i said the ultimate aim of the sufi is to reach fana fil haq which means everything else is annihilated except the truth which is haq you can call it brahman you can call it satya in sanskrit same this is the aim of the sufi and therefore the sufi does not ask you what religion you belong to but are you seriously interested in the trip because if you are interested in the trip you need to shed some of the weights that we carry in our heads mm. so before we end i'll give you a small this is a sufi story a man goes to uh, um a teacher and he wants to learn swimming okay now he is going to the teacher with a basket on his head which is full of cabbages cabbages which is just bought from so he says sir can you teach me how to swim because somebody said you are a very good teacher in this swimming swimming across the ocean of samsara and he didn't say that i am saying so the teacher said yeah surely i can teach you it requires some exercise so tell me how to do that he said i can tell you but you need to learn it actually how to do it take out that basket from your head throw away the cabbage 
turn off your clothes, wear only short clothes, jump into the water and make these movements. But you can't do it theoretically, you need to actually do this in the water. He said, yeah, I'm ready, but I cannot throw away my cabbages. He said, but if you can't throw away your cabbages, how can you swim? He said, then you're not the right teacher. I'm going to find a teacher who can teach me how to swim with the cabbages. So the teacher says, okay, then goodbye. This is a Sufi story. <laughs> yeah, that's a good story. Yeah? <laughs> So, there are many uh, Sufi stories. We don't have time here right now. Is there room for one question? You can take the Yes, please. Yeah, so um, this relates to the stations of the soul. So, the, I, th I think they also talk about chambers of the heart and with meaning the same as I understand it. And then uh, what is interesting is that they call the last final, like a second final stage as this annihilation which you described yesterday like annihilation but after the annihilation the the last station is then something like integration is something that is not any stations it's all stations and so forth yeah. so mm -hmm. can you a little bit uh, still elaborate this this phase after the initial self-realization when you actually then ground that realization into into your daily life perhaps uh, like a like a part i think you said somewhere in youtube video that um, when you actually self-realize the journey really only begins so something starts <laughs> even deepening and so is that deepening like continuously deepening deepening and deepening how much you integrate uh, how much the inside and outside comes to becomes the same since we are on the subject of uh, sufis today um, I said that they define, you know, the Sufis divide the spiritual journey into four stages. One is called the Shariat, which means the strict practices required before the iron becomes good enough to be shaped. It might be putting in the fire. If you don't put it in the fire and make it red hot, you can't change its shape. And then, when it's red hot, then you need to be hammered. Olden days, I'm talking about. <laughs> so, a disciple, when he goes to a teacher, prepares himself to be hammered. Hmm? So, all that is shariat, the practice, the ways of life one has to lead. So. The next step is called tariqat, which means the method or the way to walk on the journey. Yeah. And the third, last stage when you have walked and reached, when everything is annihilated, there is only the haq, the truth. It's called haqiqat, because it is haq, the truth. But there is one more stage, which is called the marifat. In the stage of the marifat, a person is, as you asked me just now, integrated himself wholly into the truth and therefore he sees no untruth anywhere. Even what you might be thinking you are still in untruth, but the Sufi says, but you are in truth, there is no untruth. So therefore this is so well integrated in him that he begins to live a life on earth. He doesn't isolate himself from anybody. Periods of isolation might have been necessary at one time necessary. But then he leads a life, he meets people, he talks to people, he does his daily life. But those who interact with him realize that there is a difference in this guy. He's not like us. You know, there is there's hardly any element of hatred or any element of... Um, well, you may disagree with people, but because you disagree, you don't say that guy is an idiot. You say, oh, he has his own way of thinking. And above all, the circle of self-centeredness is broken and it's becoming wider. You know? So, 
that is the stage when you have touched something and then you have come back actually it's like uh, you die on friday and you wake up on monday resurrected hmm? uh, now to be on the lighter side in kerala we have a um, um a, a, a alcohol brew made in uh, uh, without license from the government hooch it's called hooch. there's a particular drink which they call jesus christ <laughs> you know why you know why because you drink on friday and you wake up only on monday <laughs> <laughs> sorry <laughs> so after this resurrection um then you're different it's actually resurrection because you're born again you're not the old person anymore because you're based in the truth and you've come out even your garments have changed that way you function in this world that's called the stage of marifat it's not a stage actually you can't call it a station it's beyond all stations in that there is no inside and there is no outside there is no need for such a person to sit down and meditate we have to watch carefully but many people think they have reached that stage very early <laughs> <laughs> that danger is there of course so you know oh i don't need it anymore so wait a minute i said watch out carefully hmm? maybe you do maybe you do not we have to see carefully okay and what is the time we have 10 minutes more so you can discuss ha ah, i want to tell you something just you can see me right <laughs> and this fell from here right and i was searching for it in the muladhara <laughs> well it's, it's actually in the heart center <laughs> 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 left side left side of the heart <laughs> mm. no, no i can't hear them no picture no sound suddenly we have reached fana fil haq oh can you hear us ah uh, yeah but there's no image uh, oh yeah the, the connection has been quite your side or our side it's it's uh, the connection has so apparently um in on your side or our side uh, probably on your side well it, it must be um the way we I see don't. you very nicely here you can hear them no sir no you can see me oh but i can't see you oh you've become the brahman now <laughs> <laughs> thank you for the grace yes. <laughs> thanks to your teaching <laughs> i wanted to ask wait a minute we we are, we are trying to revive yeah please ask me i can hear you want to ask a question because you you mentioned in the beginning that the the sufis originated from from mongolia is that correct mm, no from the deserts of arabia oh they were desert of arabia okay okay then then mm-hmm. i don't have a question <laughs> i was just wondering if they came from mongolia how how were they no no connected oh, no. to um... uh there is a connection in mongolia but that is different not the sufis okay yeah. okay now i can see you on the laptop oh okay now we have come back okay so uh, continue we have a uh, six uh, no seven more minutes yeah mm. yes yes uh, well actually this question is uh, maybe i would like that to be a longer answer so maybe this is not really for today but i could <laughs> no. ask you that no. and you can think about it and and uh, come back with an answer no 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 in the no, evening no 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 i no i don't want to concoct answers you ah. ask me in the evening because if you ask me now then i be thinking about the answer and yeah, it may yeah. not be the right answer <laughs> yeah yeah so uh, yeah so when you ask me immediately then it comes uh, yes yeah if you can uh, sit with us a little meditation and yes please so let's chant om 
three times according to our tradition and uh, then close your eyes and meditate and I will say Hari Om Tat Sat when it's over. Hmm? Yes. Okay? Fine. Right. So start chanting Om three times. Hans, please. Oh. Hari Om Tat Sat <coughs> Om Shanti 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 So we meet again in the evening? Yeah. Yes. Thank so you for this. We <laughs> Thank you so much. Nice of you to have this time listening to me. Mm? Yes. Uh, so you can start with the question you have in the evening and then we can then go off somewhere. Mm. Yes. Let's travel. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. All of you, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. okay. See thank you, you in the evening. <laughs> sure. Let's say Om Shri Guru Om Shri Guru Om Shri Guru